This is how barbecue started for me. On a charcoal kettle grill in my backyard with an ice cold beer backed up by a cooler full in the nice, beautiful summer weather. For many of you, it's probably how you started too. And if you're just getting started with backyard barbecue, kettle grills is the way to do it. Learning the most primitive way to cook in an affordable setting in your backyard, using a kettle grill running charcoal is one of the best ways. You learn a lot about temperatures, you learn about fire control, you learn about a clean burn, you learn about direct and indirect heat. And honestly, these are some of the staples to backyard barbecue. This is how my father grilled, this is how my father's father grilled, this is how my father's father, eh, maybe not quite that long ago, but you get the picture. I'm gonna go through everything you need to know about kettle grilling between fuel source, how to light it, how to control temperature, and even do a little bit of demonstration cooking on a live fire. Grab yourself a beer and let's get started. Welcome to my series of Backyard Barbecue Basics. Today we are talking kettle grills. You can see here we have a rusty, old, beat up Weber kettle. I have run this thing through the paces for probably 10 years. And to be honest with you, when it comes to kettle grilling, this is something that is always going to be in my tool bag. I will always have a kettle grill. Why? Because they're fun to cook on, they're easy to run, and the results that you get for such a simple package is incredible. And I'm gonna show you all about that. Now, when it comes to a Weber kettle, things are simple. It's live fire, direct, indirect heat, nothing fancy. They have models that give you a little bit more features. They have the Weber Performer that gives you a little counter space to work with, but in, it's still a kettle. Now, you've got options like the SNS, the Slow and Sear Deluxe. This one here has a foldable side shelf. It has a slow and sear insert. It has a water insert. It has a bunch of features. And for just a little bit more money, you can upgrade to something like this. I've done a few cooks on this one already this summer, just for my own liking and, and checking out the product myself. And I personally love the features that come with this and it is an awesome package for the money. I will put a link down in the description if you're interested in checking them out. Check that in the description below. But when it comes to kettles, everything's simple. It doesn't matter if you have a Weber kettle or a slow and sear or SNS grill for short. It's all about live fire. So what is live fire? We are physically cooking over coals. We're cooking over a live fire. You've been to cookouts, your fathers, your grandfathers have probably done it. In fact, you've probably done it too. There's a few things about running a kettle that make them special and make them versatile, especially in just the package that it is. Now we're gonna go through some things like your charcoal choice, how you light it, how you control the temperature, the features of the grill and, and cooking space and how you can utilize it to different likings. Now, since I got this fancy brand new slow and sear, we're gonna pull this old Weber out of the way and this is what we're gonna focus on today. When it comes to kettle grills, they all are about the same in terms of basic functionality. You've got yourself a lid, completely removable. Most of them will come with a thermometer or a gauge right there on the lid. It's gonna help you monitor and maintain those temperatures. There are also a couple key components that help you control the temperature, and those are dampers. The main one that we're gonna be using and we're gonna be talking about is the one here on the lid. You also have a damper here that allows you to control the airflow coming in under the coals. So essentially, the fire is going to breathe from underneath through the bottom of the grill, up through the coals, and vents out the top. Now temperature is all about fuel and airflow, essentially. So our fuel is our charcoal, and our airflow is basically the gas that we're putting on the fire. The more open and wide open and the more airflow that we allow to cover the coals, the hotter that fire is going to get. So if you're gonna be doing low and slow cooking, or you're gonna be doing some barbecue, or you're gonna be doing some high heat grilling, everything is gonna be about airflow. A common misconception about fire control in a kettle grill is that more charcoal means more heat. That is false. Granted, you do need enough fuel. So, you know, a handful isn't gonna produce a long 700 degree grill, uh, but you also don't need the entire kettle full of charcoal either. So today we're gonna be talking a little bit about that. Now, another controversial topic is gonna be fuel source. You've got your lump charcoal, you've got your briquettes. They come in different sizes, flavors, brands. And let me tell you what, Everybody asks all the time, lump or briquette, briquette or lump, Jealous Devil or Kingsford, B&B &B or the Good Charcoal Company. Let me tell you what, for me, I don't really think that it matters. I have made great food with standard Kingsford briquettes and I've made good food with 
Lump Charcoal of various brands. Now there's one caveat and one thing that I actually, from experience, will tell you makes a difference. Briquettes are the most consistent. I don't know how many times I've bought a bag of Lump Charcoal and found that it was completely filled with just dust and tiny little chunks of broken up lump charcoal to the point where it doesn't light good, it doesn't get good airflow, and really it's a crappy overall product. I have had bags, in fact, I have another bag of this in the garage that I opened and it's almost completely pulverized. When it comes to briquettes, I will say 95 out of 100 bags are absolutely perfect. Yes, will there be some broken ones? Yes, will there be dust on the bottom? But I will say I've had the most consistent quality control coming out of briquettes. Now, do I think some of the lump charcoal is a little bit more premium? No additives, no chemicals, anything like that? Absolutely. But when I spend 15 or $20 on a bag of charcoal and it's completely broken up into tiny pieces and dust, it's useless. Now, when it comes to briquettes, there is one thing that I want to tell you right now. Do not buy match light charcoal. Don't buy it. If you're starting a campfire that you're not gonna be cooking on, fine, do whatever. Use lighter fluid, use gas. We don't do that here. We don't use any petroleum products to get the fire started. Now, let's talk about that. When it comes to lighting your charcoal grill, this right here is the most effective and affordable tool that you can possibly have. This is what we call a chimney starter. You load the charcoal up in here. There's a space or gap underneath. There's vents here to allow airflow, and we use something like this. This is a tumbleweed starter. They're cheap, they work really well, and they don't really interfere with your food. There's no harsh chemicals or anything like that. Essentially, what we do is we light this, we set this on top. Now, we're not doing that right here. In fact, what I typically do is I will make sure that the bottom vent is wide open and I will light it right here on the grill. If there's any ashes or particles that fall down while it's burning, it's not going in the yard, it's not going on the driveway, it's not going on the deck, it's falling right here into the place it's supposed to be. So now let's get some charcoal lit. Like I said, I've been a big fan of briquettes. My dad used these forever, the Kingsford, the blue bag, I've used the professional, they're all good and they're consistent when it comes to quality. We're gonna go ahead and use some of this today. Now for most cooks, I'm gonna use a full chimney. Got my tumbleweed starter placed below. I'm gonna use a lighter. I'm gonna get that thing lit. Place that right on top. And we're gonna give this a few minutes to get lit and I'm gonna show you how you know when the charcoal is ready to actually get into the grill. Getting your charcoal lit is just the first step. Now that we've had it lit, we want to know when it is ready. The charcoal itself will start to get white caps. It'll start to turn a little ashy and you will notice a, a lot of heat actually coming from this chimney. As you can see here, we've got flames escaping the top. The charcoal on the top is starting to, to show its ash. It's time to get this down into the slow and sear. Now what's special about this slow and sear, this s, s kettle, is the fact that we have the slow and sear deluxe. This is basically a way for us to capture all of the charcoal into one corner of the grill and keep it contained. We're gonna go ahead and dump that down evenly. Now, we're going to get the grate back on top. Now, when it comes to grilling on this, you've got two different options. You've got the direct and indirect heat. The slow and sear is the best of both worlds. You have direct heat contained on one side, you have an away from the coals side as well, which we're gonna call the cool side, which allows you to take food on and off that direct heat. This is perfect when you're doing sears, like on burgers or steaks. It allows you to achieve that sear without burning the surface, because what can you do? You can just spin the food away from the heat. Now it's no longer directly above the coals. It works great for methods like reverse searing, where you're gonna keep it away from the heat, let it slowly rise up to temperature, and then slide it over here, over the direct coals to achieve that nice sear. So to demonstrate some of that functionality, we're gonna go ahead and make ourselves a steak today. We're gonna to start off with a T-bone, a grass-fed, grass-finished T-bone from Certified Piedmontese. These are some awesome steaks, and perfect for this direct and indirect heat demonstration. We'll pat dry this mostly dry, just to get any purge off of that meat. As you can see, even as a grass-fed T-bone, this has some great marbling. 
Now for seasoning, we're gonna be using the Bearded Butcher's Buttery Blend. This is one of my favorites on steaks. It's honestly great. You get a nice coating on the steak itself. Season down the sides, don't forget those. And we'll flip it over. Now for temperature control, you're probably wondering, what am I supposed to set this at? What I do is I always leave this bottom damper all the way open. Now that we've got the steak seasoned up, get yourself a good pair of tongs. This is one of the best tools that you can use on a grill like this. Something that gives you some length to stay away from the heat and something that's sturdy, that's gonna hold a large piece of meat, something heavy like this T-bone. Now today we're gonna be searing first and then slow cooking it to, to finish. So what are you gonna do? You're gonna set this sucker right down above that slow and sear, right above those coals. And we're gonna leave it there for a moment. Now, one of the easiest methods to remove from the direct flames when it comes to these kettles is just grab the handle or the grate, and spin it around. Now the steak is no longer on top of the coals, it's away from that direct heat. We're gonna give this side of the grill just a moment to heat up, then we're gonna flip it over and apply heat to that side. Now, when it comes to steaks right now, I'm not really worried about temperature. I just want some hot coals to sear it. Apply this to the hot grate. It's gonna give you those grill lines. Now, you could apply some butter. You could base some butter right now. That's something that I do a lot when it comes to steak. Now, if you're cooking a steak like a ribeye, something that has a little bit of extra fat, as it drips down into those coals, you may see some flare ups. So you may need to pull it away, you know, from the heat a little bit. You can see we're getting some nice golden color there. We've got the color that we want. We're gonna get this over here and get this lid closed. When it comes to kettle cooking, you have to understand temperature control. Like I said, this damper down at the bottom, we're keeping it full open. Full open is going to give us anywhere from 450 plus. Now, if we want something medium heat, 350 to 450, then we're gonna turn this to half. It's gonna restrict some of the flow. It's gonna slow down the flow of air into the grill and it's gonna cool it down. But you have to understand it's not gonna happen immediately. The fire actually has to choke down a little bit. If we're looking for a lower temperature, like 250 to 350, we're gonna want this a quarter open. And if we want this to be 225 to 250, we need about an eighth of, of the way open. In fact, it's gonna look mostly closed. Adjusting this here is going to choke out the fire. It's going to choke it down to where it's just a smolder, but it's going to take some time. So in the case of the steak right now, this grill is 400 degrees, you know? So we have to pay closer attention to the fire itself and we have to pay attention to temperature. Now, since this is a back to the basics barbecue series, and we're starting here with this kettle grill with a simple steak, this right here is a Thermaworks Thermapen 1. This is one of the best tools that you can possibly have when it comes to backyard barbecue. This right here is the difference between, eh, I guessed in this steak is pretty close, or this is absolutely perfect. So for me, since I got this, my barbecue has improved significantly. Temperatures are spot on because I'm able to monitor it accurately. So get yourself an instant read thermometer. These are about a hundred bucks. They have cheaper versions that are available that are much more affordable down to like the 25 to $30 range. And honestly, it'll change the way you cook. Since we are concerning ourselves with temperature a little bit, why don't we check on the steak? We did sear it. Let's see how much we've affected that steak. Now, as you can see, we have a pretty hefty sear on that steak. We've got some dark spots and we're reading, honestly, in the 80s. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna position this steak as far away from the heat as possible, leaving the coldest part of the steak closest to the fire. And I'm gonna get this lid closed, which I have at that about 225 to 250 setting on that damper. And we're just gonna let this go. We're looking for a medium rare. I'm probably gonna pull this thing at about 130, 132. This T-bone steak should be just about done. Pull out my instant read thermometer. Like I said, we're looking for like 132, 133. We're right on the money. I'm gonna pull this steak and you can see here, that thing is beautiful. We're gonna get this off to the side. We're gonna let it rest. Resting your meat is great. Dome it up with a piece of foil, wrap it up with some saran wrap, rest it for about five to 10 minutes. Now the steak is off and it is resting. We're gonna give that like five to 10 minutes, but you're probably saying, well, what am I supposed to do? 
This grill's still hot, fire's still going, charcoal is still cherry red. What are you supposed to do? Well, the best way to handle it is completely shut the air off. This is going to choke out the fire. Now we'll come down here, we'll turn this off. Now one thing to notice is we do have an ash collection here. While that grill is running, the little bits and pieces of charcoal and little embers and ash, they're gonna fall down into the bowl of the grill. And since we were cooking with that bottom damper open completely, that ash is gonna fall into that ash clean out pan. Now, we're gonna shut this off. The charcoal is gonna continue to burn until we smother it basically by cutting off the oxygen supply because we've closed both of those dampers. The charcoal is gonna continue to ash. So the next time that you go to use this, once it cools down, a lot of that ash is gonna fall down. It's cool, it's gonna be safe. You're gonna be able to clean this out, remove all the ash and unused charcoal and get rid of it. Cooking with a kettle grill is honestly pretty freaking simple. In fact, it's one of the most primitive and basic ways to cook that you can possibly do. I will always have a kettle grill in my arsenal because pulling out the grill to do some steaks, pulling out the grill to do some burgers, and just getting that good charcoal flavor on your food it can't be reproduced anywhere else. And for the low price that some of these kettles run, like a Weber kettle or like the Slow and Sear Deluxe, they're very affordable. Now, even with the Slow and Sear Deluxe, there are cheaper options that don't have the Slow and Sear, that have a different version of the Slow and Sear. Check them out, got a link down in the description. Now, I'll tell you what, our steak's been resting. Let's go ahead and cut into that and give it a try because we gotta know, how'd we do? Let's give it a try. Very delicious steak. Even this grass-fed, grass-finished, being a little leaner, had a great marbling. And this thing is super juicy. You can 100% tell with every single bite that this came off of a charcoal grill. And honestly, you could see how simple that was. Super delicious, super simple. And that is all this Back to the Basics barbecue series is about. We're gonna be attacking a ton of recipes, anywhere from bone-in steaks, boneless steaks, roast, thin things like flank steaks, hanger steaks, bavette steaks. We're gonna be doing chicken, ribs, pretty much everything in between, and it's all gonna be done on the kettle. So be sure to subscribe and I'll see you in the next video of this Back to the Basics barbecue series.